thank you for making it to this session. It is always um, interesting to see how many people will turn up post-lunch. So this is a good turnout. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, now, uh, all the sports jokes have already been done this morning, so I can't do any of those. I'll, I'll think of some others as I go along here. Um, uh, soccer, yes, yes, yes. Um, or tennis, you know, tennis. We just finished the US Open here in New York. Um, OK, so a little bit about the topic today, right? So orchestration and operationalization, right? So somebody asked me, well, why, why is this and operationalization? Isn't orchestration meant to, it's, it's considered an operational discipline? And I said, well, it is. But you know, we, we see a little bit of distinction. And I'll, I'll get to that later in my presentation. So I'm planting some seeds so that you'll stay here. Um, so we're going to talk about, there was a lot of discussion about data. Data and AI is the theme of the event. Uh, not just the theme of the event, it's the theme in everybody's company. Um, there's a lot of uh, buzz around this. And data really is the fuel for AI. If you're going to do AI, we heard a lot about that, that you really need good data. And getting to good data has lots of steps orchestration is really, really important. So we're going to spend about the next 40 minutes taking a look at what's going on in the data world, why is data ops become so important now, and most importantly, what are we doing in this space, OK? And I feel like the room is, it's, is, is just about big enough where we can take questions as we go, OK? So feel free to just you know um, stop me at any time. The, the light glare is just enough where I might not see your hand, so throw something at me, and, and I'll respond, OK? Um, so let's dive into it. So we heard from Ayman, we heard from Ram. The strategy we have um, now is called Connected Digital Ops. BMC has been around a long time, and ops has been our bread and butter, and we really feel that ops is now front and center, and hence the connected digital ops story. And we're going to focus in this session, as I said, on data ops. So let's start with a very high level view of what's going on in the world of data. Well, if you can't see what's on the screen, it's OK, because um, it's sort of not meant to be read. What this is is called MAD. Machine Learning, Artificial Intelligence, and Data Landscape. There's a company called Firstmark, less known by the, the name of the company, but by the name of the founder, Matt Truck. He every year publishes this landscape of data and data-related technologies and AI. And it has now become where it's almost like a blur of multiple, you know, it's a multicolored blur is, is what, what this industry has become. And Guess what? There's lots of tools in the market, and companies are spending a lot of money on these tools. Okay, um, this is just just one number, and by 2026, it is expected that just the. By the way, it's important to note here. This is just data and analytics software market. Okay, that's going to approach over 200 billion dollars in by 2026. So clearly, lots of tools in the market, lots of money being spent on it, because you know, it goes without saying that focus on data is, is now front and center because it's no longer the agenda of the CIO or the CTO. This is being driven by the CEOs. I was very um, fascinated to read, um, somebody sent it to me, that J.P. Morgan Chase, in its annual report to the shareholders, had a section, I think it was under um, issues facing our company. Uh, there was a whole section on really an update on their adoption of AI, data, and cloud. And it talks about how many applications have they refactored over the last year, what their movement in the cloud is. I mean, the fascinating thing is that it's in the letter to the shareholders now. It's important enough where now this needs shareholders need to be updated on the data AI strategy and where you are with, the, with, with cloud. And they do this, I was told they've done this like every year since the last two or three years, right? So this is a so this explains why there's so much spending, because the business really cares about getting value out of data. It's not just like some technology agenda. Um, but the, 
and, and Ram talked about this earlier, the report card for what data initiatives were supposed to accomplish is less than stellar, okay? Uh, depending on what analysts you follow, it's 80%, 85%, uh, for a lack of better term, I'll just call it failure rate. These projects are not making it beyond pilot and, and immediately the question is, well, if there's so much interest that CEOs are putting this stuff in letter to the shareholders, clearly a lot of money is being spent on it, but well, why is it that the report card is less than stellar? And beyond just looking at analysts who have now identified operationalization as an issue, even if you just do a general Google search on why data projects are failing, in the top three, four results that you'll see, there are lots of reasons. I mean, I think some of those were touched upon even this morning in the keynote. You've got shortage of data scientists, you've got shortage of data engineers, uh, security is a big issue, but operationalization is now being identified as a very important area, which is, if you don't get a handle on this, you're not going to succeed in data projects. So if ops is the problem, the industry's response to that has been, well, we must need a new operational model, right? And we're seeing data ops that has come up as a model. There's ML ops, model ops, and lots of variations of this all being, all being designed and implemented so that you can operationalize data initiatives faster and at scale, okay? And data ops now, you know, when, when analysts create a category for it, you know it's like being considered as a market. So Gartner recently released what they call market guide for data ops. If you're not familiar with the Gartner terminology of things, market guide is something they release for a new category, a category that is still emerging. They haven't published like a magic quadrant uh, of, or, or anything of that sort. And you can see that there's um, quite a few vendors in here and it's a little hard to see. We are, we are um, obligated to share this slide exactly the way Gartner publishes it. So, but Helix Control M and Control M have both been uh, identified as products in the orchestration space in the data ops market guide. Right. So, a lot of money being spent. New operational models coming up. Analysts are now categorizing this as a market. But it's not just, this is really interesting and we feel, um, at BMC we feel sort of a little bit vindicated when, when we see this because we've been saying this for a long time, that ops cannot just be something that you do at the end of a go live. You know, ops doesn't start there. You really need to think about ops as part of the engineering life cycle. And we are now seeing many analysts and the general discourse in the industry is that you know you need to sort of begin with the end in mind you need to think how you're going to operationalize it and um, this is from a report titled five ways to enhance data engineering practices and you can see that orchestration is an important block here so i've i've followed this industry and space for a long time they have been a lot of coverage by the analysts for ops and ops models, but this is sort of really new, at least in the analyst space, where we are seeing a lot of emphasis on saying that you need to think about operations as part of an engineering life cycle and not something that happens post go live. And we're not just hearing this from analysts. I mean, you, you'll get copies of this slide, but this is what we heard from a very large North American telco. And this was somebody from the Office of the Chief Data Officer unit and saying, and it's the same thing, a lot of money being given to them to operationalize data projects, and it's a challenge. You know, business gets ping pong between multiple teams. Well, I know for ops folks, that's, that's not necessarily, that's a little bit of old hat, but now the business really cares about this because it's no longer something that IT is doing business is interested in extracting value quickly from this. So Control M and Helix Control M's focus within data ops is specifically around orchestration. So it's important that we um, define what that is. By the way, I meant to ask this question when we started, but I'll do it now. How many of you are using Control M today? Just a quick show of hands. Okay, so we've got it. Got a number of you who are, who are using this. So you, this will sound very familiar to you. 
because you're using it today. If you look at a data pipeline, now whether you are orchestrating a relatively simple BI project or you're doing complex AI deep neural network type of initiative, there's a lowest common denominator in all of those projects, which is data ingestion, data storage and processing, and analytics. And you have lots of different moving parts in all of these stages. You've got multiple sources for ingestion. There's no shortage of storage and processing um, options. And by the way, something else that's important to note here, in the stat that I showed earlier about you know, $90 billion have been having spent on the software for data and analytics and expected to grow 200 plus billion by 210 plus billion by 2026. In that same report, there was something else that was interesting, that by 2026, significant majority, I think almost 70% of that data and analytics software spend will be on public cloud. So what that really tells you is that data is, is the most popular use case on public cloud, essentially. And this is where you, you see like sort of in the middle, that's where you'll see almost exclusively being dominated by ETL tooling now on the cloud, analytics software now on the cloud. So with all of these moving parts in between, there's one thing that everybody will agree on, at least when you're planning. It's like, well, in production, all of this should be, should be automated, right? Nobody will say, well, let's, let's launch you know, a new AI initiative, new machine learning initiative. Well, let's keep automation at a minimum. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll throw bodies at the problem when we get to production. No, it, it should be highly automated. Everybody agrees. But if we, if we step away from that and we look at, well, how does an engineer view a data initiative? Well, to them, it looks something like this. I mean, fraud detection is a very common use case uh, for mo modern you know, data engineering, looking at ML models that can predict fraud. Um, predictive maintenance is another one. Sort of underneath it all, you could maybe generalize this as you know, a high level anomaly detection. And both of these, you know, fraud detection one is, is a pipeline that is exclusively on GCP. The predictive maintenance in this example is exclusively sort of on the AWS ecosystem. But when you zoom out of it, the data pipeline is not the way it is in the last slide. In reality, you have really, at, at a very general level, at least two layers. The data pipeline gets the data from where? Well, it's, a lot of it is coming from systems of record, transactional systems, okay, that are not necessarily considered part of the pipeline itself. And some of the common use cases where Control M has been used by many of you are things like procurement, financial close, invoicing, billing, and you may be running this across core banking systems, brokerage systems, uh, SAP, and so on and so forth. And when you get to the data layer, some of the more modern use cases where a lot of that money that we talked about is being spent are things like you know, churn detection, fraud detection, predictive maintenance, and the orchestration layers between these two are not you know, mutually exclusive. We believe that there is a high degree of interoperability that's needed between the two. Now, at the bottom are there's Control M. We have many customers. Many of you I know are using Control M to orchestrate data pipelines. But we have seen, particularly in the open source space, adoption of tools like Airflow for automating data pipelines. Now, we often get this question that, well, you know, we've got Control M here at the top layer. We've got it at the little bit in the in the data pipeline space. But we're seeing like you know adoption of lots of other tools, and. At the end of my presentation, hopefully you will agree with me that Control M has some best-in-class capabilities for data pipeline orchestration. But we also realize that in the market, there may be other orchestrators that have been adopted. And this is where we are taking the approach of interoperability by integrating with, with some of these tools. The first one we've integrated with is Airflow. Okay? So if you've got a team that has spent three, four years building an Airflow practice, they may recognize Control M as a better option, but they've just spent too much time with it. Well, you don't have to live in this space where there's no connection between the two. We're looking at an integration approach, and the use case for that is that, you know, how do you know 
invoicing and billing data that's going to feed a data pipeline, how do you know that invoicing billing is done before you can start running your data pipelines? Um, and that is, although on the surface pretty simple, but the moment you start asking that question and you get some very interesting answers. Um, I was at a conference a few years ago and I heard somebody present a 45 minute session on, on their data initiative. And I asked them, well, where's a lot of this data coming from? They said, well, SAP is a massive you know, source of data for us and it comes, comes from there. And something else is orchestrating SAP and they're using something else to orchestrate the data pipeline. I said, well, so how does your data pipeline know that it's, it's time to start? SAP has actually finished what it was supposed to be doing. And they said, well, we create, a, we create like this flat file that lands somewhere and then you know, something sees that and then we, we know to start the data pipeline. Well, that's um, using duct tape and, and, and bailing wire to, uh, to, to connect systems. And we believe you shouldn't have to do that. You should be able to look at these things from a single pane of glass. And we've started with Airflow. Airflow has, has had a lot of adoption in the open source space amongst the data engineers. And we're looking at other options as we go. And our view is that, as I said, you should be able to orchestrate this from a single pane of glass. We see Helix Control M and Control M really as layers of abstraction, okay? So here's what we consider the blueprint for good orchestration. What does, and this is where I'll come to what I what sort of started at the beginning with, orchestration and operationalization. You know, orchestration, quite simply, is the ability to stitch together a sequence of tasks. You can, you can do that in a variety of ways. You can write your own scripts. You can perhaps use some, some simple open source tool to do it. But operationalizing it and running it in production has other characteristics, and, and I'll talk about that. Um, I, was, I was at the uh, Airflow Summit two years ago. At uh, that time, it was uh, still like a hybrid. This was sort of right as we were getting out of COVID. So some of the sessions were in person, but they were also being you know, broadcasted live. So part of the session was at the AWS headquarters in Seattle. And there was a gentleman from, from a company that really I think Wall Street would consider or many would consider like a unicorn that wasn't around maybe six or seven years ago and has has you know, done wonders in the industry they're in. So the data architect presented, gave a really good overview of what they were doing. Lots of people were, were watching them because you know, they're, they're sort of considers, considered leaders in that space. And I asked him, well, okay, so I understand that you know, you're, you're stressing a lot on orchestration, but help me understand what happens when a job fails. Uh, particularly a situation where you've got a job that has failed and it really hasn't failed because something was wrong with that job, but it's failing because something bad happened three, three steps above it upstream. And, and without thinking, without blinking, he said, oh, that's a, that's a poor show. He didn't say poor, I'm abstracting that, he used some other word. But he's like, we jump on a bunch of Slack channels and there's a lot of back, back and forth. And that's what I mean by operationalization. You know, they're accomplishing orchestration, but how you run production and how you handle those situations, because the best design workflows will have a problem. You know, you don't control network, you don't control a lot of other things that can cause a pipeline to be interrupted, right? So we believe these eight categories, they're not sort of like an exhaustive list, but we believe these rise to the top. Number one, a good orchestration engine should be able to support a wide variety of technologies in a data pipeline and beyond. SLA management is really important. Nobody is kicking off these workflows and saying, well, yeah, we'll kick it off. It doesn't matter when it finishes. Most of these things have very tight deadlines, and I, I, I don't need to stress that to this audience. You guys live this every day. Um, error handling and notification. Like I said, you know, when things go wrong, who should be notified? should be able to visualize what happened three steps above, what, what's gonna happen three steps below. And this also is really important when you think about the relationship between the data pipeline and the application layer. 
if you can't see what happened in SAP and Oracle, and you're just looking at your data pipeline in, in, in one tool, well, how do you know that the data pipeline isn't running because, or it ran too early? That's another thing we see. That data pipe, well, you know, usually the core banking system and SAP are done by 4 p.m., so we'll start at 5. Well, guess what? They weren't done by 5, and you started your pipeline, and now you've run halfway through it, and you've got, you've got a pipeline that's run on incomplete data. Um, anybody ever experienced that? <laughs> okay. Um, Self-healing and remediation, what do we mean by that? So if you take that to the next logical step, okay, so you had a failure, great, the right people got notified about it. Uh, well, what should happen the next time you have the same problem? Let's say it was a network failure that caused the pipeline to be interrupted. Somebody was paged, they look at it and go, oh, okay, well, we simply need to rerun this workflow because it was a network problem. Well, the next time you have the exact same issue, you shouldn't have to have human intervention the workflow orchestration engine should have the right policies that you can build in and say, well, if you have this exact same problem next time, we run this at least three times before you start paging someone. End to end visibility, as obvious that it, that as it is, this is the one thing. When we talk to customers globally and ask them what's the most important thing about Control M, they will invariably tell us like the one thing that we get from everybody is the ability to visualize a workflow across multiple systems from a single screen. Appropriate user experience for multiple personas. You, you all know this as practitioners that this is a team sport. You've got application teams, you've got ops teams, you've got process owners and business stakeholders that are ultimately you know, waiting for the results of everything that we're automating. And they all need better access, better visibility, and you should have the right user experience for them. A developer may only need a very API-driven approach to interact with the workflow orchestration engine. Uh, ops may need APIs and dashboards. A business user may just need you know, an update in, in, in their uh, dashboard or, or newsfeed that you know, something has, has completed, updated, if it's late, by how long. Standards for running and production. So. How many of you run jobs in production with no standards? No naming conventions, no nothing, right? That's, I, I see a few of you laughing, that's funny. Um, and that, but that's important, and you guys all know that that is, that can be, that's easier said than done. And this is where we believe the orchestration engine should be able to guide people who are building workflows and what the standards are. If you hire a new developer or a new ops person, you should not have to go get a PhD in the operational standards of the company, the tool should be able to guide you to what the standards are. Um, supporting DevOps practices. Now that's important because the industry's realization is that software development life cycle should be an automated process. You should have automated builds. You should have automated testing. You should have automated deployment. And we believe that orchestration should be considered an artifact of the application or the code. You should treat it just like you treat the rest of the code, and you should be able to fit workflows and, and be able to fit them in automated delivery pipelines, such as CI-CD pipelines. So what are some of the most important capabilities that Control-M offers that make it a very, very strong option to orchestrate data and application workflows? So the first one that we've paid a lot of attention to over the last 18 months or so has been integrations. And this is really, really important for the data world because as we talked about earlier, much of the money that's gonna be spent or is being spent on data is being spent on public cloud. Cloud has lots of different tools to do a variety of things. ETL is one of the most important things that people do in the world of of data, a lot of ETL, if you look at offerings like AWS Glue, you look at Dataproc, and others have really moved to serverless models. Um, serverless is interesting because when you think about your orchestration strategy for serverless, or also known as PaaS, Platform as a Service, traditionally, you have a VM, you install an agent there, and you run your workflows. 
Well, it's serverless. There's no infrastructure for you to put an agent on. The only way you can communicate with these services is through an API. And what you see here is a subset of the integrations that we offer today. And you can see many of these are in the data and analytics space. And a significant majority of that are focused on cloud services like Glue, Databrew, Dataproc, Azure Data Factory, and, and many others. We've made a lot of investment in this space. There's a dedicated team within engineering that's focused only on delivering integrations. We're releasing about two to three a month. We plan to accelerate that. The other thing we've done is we've decoupled the release of these integrations from uh, our major releases, which is now every seven months. So every month, we're releasing these integrations so that you don't have to wait three months, six months, seven months. And even if, you, if we, you waited seven months, it's not really seven because we release it. Even if you got it the day we released it, you have to test it. And by the time you put it in production, you're looking at a little bit of a lead time. So this, this way, as this comes out, you can quickly test and, and deploy this in your, in your organization. We talked about SLA management. That's really important. You should be able to visualize things as what we call business services. You shouldn't have to always look at a complicated workflow and have tribal knowledge to say, well, this set of jobs right here that runs between 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. represents fraud detection pipeline or payroll or invoicing. What you see on a screen, if you're, if you're familiar with the SLA management within Control M, is to elevate this up to a business service level and say, OK, well, I've got a machine learning pipeline that's made up of 15 jobs. We have completed 10 of those, five more to go. Is it going to be on time or not? And this is also goes to the earlier point of appropriate experience for users. So if you've got a business user, they may not necessarily care how many jobs make up a service. They need to know if it's on time or not. And when you have a problem, you should, you should be able to tie this to what business impact do we have. So Hershey's has been a customer of Control M for many years. And a couple of years ago, we did, we did a case study with them. And in there, they shared something very, an interesting incident. Um, they shared with us that they have a massive SAP landscape. A lot of their procurement, supply chain, supply planning runs through SAP. And one day, out of the 14, I think, global SAP instances, one of them was hung. And Control M could not submit jobs to that particular instance. The alerting that came out of Control M wasn't just unable to submit job 3245. It was unable to submit these jobs, and these impact product distribution. So they said the, their reaction to that type of notification was very different had it just been, you know, something hasn't run. They immediately understood that if they don't get ahead of this issue right now, they have trucks at the loading dock that will not be filled with product, and they're not going to put product on shelves. Okay? And they said, without this type of notification, it could have taken them hours to figure out what the impact of a few jobs not running on time is to the business. So, Extending this thought of multiple personas that need to interact with it, engineers, particularly in the data space, are a major, major stakeholder in, in developing workflows. And um, I was talking to a few of you earlier, and we hear the sentiment very, very clearly that there is a need for folks other than just operations to interact with it. But it's important that they're getting a user experience that, that they like. And in the data science world, it's really important. Um, it reminds me of a, of a joke slash question. So why should you take a data scientist with you to the jungle? Anybody want to take a crack at it? Jungle, yes. Well, the answer is because they can take care of all the Python problems. OK? OK? So well. In the jungle of, of, of data, right, it really is becoming a jungle. If you think back to the first slide I had, we have released um, Control M Python client. The ability to natively interact with Control M through Python, okay? Um, the other joke is about 
data science is like the data science motto is if you don't get it right the first time, call it version 1.0. Okay. So again, I, I, I joke a lot with my data friends. So anyway, back to the serious stuff. This is, if you haven't tested this yet, I highly encourage you to explore this and, and let some of the data engineers or engineers in general, Python is not exclusive to the data engineering world, allow them to get their hands on this and give this a test drive and see what kind of feedback you get. Workbench. So again, if you're going to allow somebody to, to get their hands on something and test, well, you probably don't want them doing that in a production environment. Control M Workbench is, to just keep it simple, think of it as like a developer edition of Control M, which is free of cost. You can download it, and it runs on your machine. You can you know, build workflows. You can test them. And that makes early stage testing and allowing people to sort of you know, get their feet wet early without really getting access to production environments or pre-prod environments much, much easier. Talk about business users, right? So you've got the ability to expose service level information from the web client. You can do that through the Control and Mobile app. And the quote I have here is really interesting because it's not some from someone in IT. You know, Gillen at Sky, his response is in finance, and he has responsibility over billing and invoicing. And it's really, really important for him to know that that process is going to complete on time. And if it's not on time, what's the, it's, it's sort of like tracking a package, right? Am I, is the package just laid by an hour or am I not getting it today at all, right? Anybody ever get calls from their business users about when, when my workflows are going to be done or when, is it late? Yeah. So you, you, can, you can get ahead of that problem. That's the good news. So a customer example of, to, to sort of put it in perspective through the lens of a customer. Raylink um, has been a Control-M customer for years. It's, if you're not familiar with Raylink, it's a really interesting company. They, are they provide technology services to the railroad industry in North America. So there are a variety of services such as, one is called Asset Health. All of these tracks, there's, by the way, when we did this case study, we found out there's 140,000 miles of railroad tracks across the United States. And there is, I think about, I think it may be on the next slide, 1.6 million rail cars. All of these things have sensors that are constantly generating data, and they ingest that data, apply machine learning to them, and they figure out which one of these may have a problem so that they don't break down as they're carrying freight and our packages aren't late as a result of that. So, and some of the other things they do, they also act almost like you know, air traffic control for the railroad industry. So if they, they can see a train that's approaching Chicago is delayed, what other trains need to be held back or rerouted so you don't have this situation of a log jam at the, at the Chicago interchange. So clearly they, they're dealing with a lot of data. Here's some of the stats of, of, of the amount of data that they're dealing with on a regular basis. And I think the architecture is probably less interesting because you guys all have that. What I liked about this slide was they tied it all to business outcomes. Okay. Uh, predictive maintenance, predictive ERA, uh, fleet management simulation. And I think that is really, really important when we think back to the, or the problem statement where we started with data. Well, why is it that there is so much money being spent and yet, so, well, one of the things is really, really being able to tie these outcomes to business value. Like, what is it doing for our business? And most importantly, if we don't do this right, what's the impact of the business? Because this session is for data ops, this is why I specifically chose this quote from the Reelink case study. Being able to run stuff without having people sitting in front of consoles 24 by 7. Well, that, in essence, you know, is the spirit of data ops, is that you want to operationalize things in a manner which requires minimal human intervention. Um, and this broadly applies to beyond just data, whether you're doing 
financial close automation, claims automation, whatever it is, you really should be thinking about it from an approach of how do we minimize the number of war rooms we're involved in? Because you know? a lot of companies get things done on time, but it's very chaotic. The number of um, people that are involved in resolving problems and so on and so forth, that is often a cost uh, that costs you in an, on the innovation front. Because when you're asked to go do more on the innovation front, it's like, well, how do we, how do we peel away? How do we break away from just running things on a daily basis so that we could focus on innovation?